Hi everyone, this is Aubrey Chavez from Faith Matters. In this episode, we speak with two amazing guests, Kimberly and Matt Teeter. Matt and Kimberly have been married for 10 years. Kimberly is a clinical psychologist at the Utah Center for Evidence-Based Treatment, and Matt is an assistant principal and bishop of their ward in Salt Lake City. In this episode, they discuss their experience as an interracial couple in the church, their experience of privilege in the different roles that they have, what it's been like navigating local leadership right now, and how we can make our spaces safer for minorities of any kind. Even with their extremely busy schedules, Matt and Kimberly were so kind to join us for a late night conversation. We just want to preface that they have two adorable kids, and in the podcast, you'll hear some family sounds in the background as we talk. If you'd like to read a transcript of the conversation, head over to the website at faithmatters.org and click on the post with this conversation. We're so grateful that Matt and Kimberly came on the podcast, and we hope that you enjoy this conversation. Okay, Kimberly and Matt Teeter, thank you guys so much for, for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having us. Our pleasure. Yeah, it's uh, no, it's our pleasure. We, I thought, um, I thought that maybe if it's okay, we'd love to to start out just hearing a little bit more about about your stories. Um, you know, go back as far as you want, and just if you wouldn't mind sharing, you know, how you both uh, found the church, uh, found each other, and feel free to take us up. And I, we would love to hear even, you know, once you get up to sort of the last few few weeks, you know, what that's uh, been like for you as well, if that's okay. Sure. Mm-hmm. I guess I'll start. You're I'm older. Old. I'm the older. <laughs> I just turned 38, so I'll start. Okay. Uh, chronological. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we'll go chronological. So um, the church uh, found my mom in the 19, late 1970s, and two missionaries were knocking doors in upstate New York in the snow, and she took pity on them and let them in, and she heard the discussions. My father did too, uh, and she ended up converting my dad. Uh, remain Catholic, and then eventually, I mean, there's there's a whole lot of backstory to it, but eventually they, the tensions between the two um, came to a head, and they ended up getting divorced. I don't remember any of this, because by the time that happened, I was only like two or three at the time when they separated, and then four or five when the divorce was finalized. Um, so my ma- then my mom, she married, uh, uh, had a second spouse who was a member of the church, and uh, he uh, was a fully active member. So I was kind of like raised in the church in that way, but I still saw my father on the weekends and I would go with him sometimes to Catholic mass, especially during like the big holidays and stuff like Easter or Christmas, and like all good Catholics. And, uh, <laughs> and then uh, they both ended up, my, both my parents actually ended up getting divorced again from their second spouses. So they, my dad remarried and my mom remarried. They both ended up getting divorced. So, uh, I wasn't actually too keen on the idea of marriage, which is ironic, I know, being a, a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day right. Saints. But I knew it was kind of like my my duty to do that, and uh, uh, eventually someday. So, um, you know, flash forward uh, to when I was 27, and I meet uh, Kimberly in New York City. She's an NYU undergrad, and I'm going to uh, Columbia to get a, a master's. And uh, we kind of hit it off and we ended up uh, courting for about a year and a half, I guess it was. And then we ended up getting sailed in the Washington, D.C. temple, which was both of our temples, uh, temple for both of us growing up. Um, even though I was in New York and she was in North Carolina, it's kind of equidistant between our two geographic areas. It right? is okay. exactly like by the minute from his house. To the temple and my house to the temple. No way. Same uh, amount uh, of minutes. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so yeah. So I think in a, a nutshell, that's kind of my trajectory in the church. Great. Um. So I grew up in the church. Basically, I, I think for both of us, um, the church is like our predominant religious tradition that we've grown up in, even if like our parents had other things that kind of like seeped in through the the sometimes um so for me my mom and my oldest uh half brother yeah I said that right my mom and my oldest half brother (laughs) um got baptized in 1990 um when I was two years old and then my dad got baptized a couple years later we had a string of Uh, sister missionaries that were in and out of our home so I don't remember my mom and brother being baptized but I remember like my dad taking the discussions pretty well and the sisters coming and 
I was thinking about uh, how I got some of these opinions about various things that I have in the church. Um, but I feel like it was helpful for me to see sisters be the main missionaries that were teaching my family. Um, because some of this stuff about women in the church, I didn't grow up thinking about the same way in part because my mom was so strong and she was the first one to get baptized. And then in part because of all of these wonderful women that we had um, in our lives. Um, And they, you know, they did everything for us. They made like a little FAT chart. Like we have all these pictures of them. And and so they're really fun. And uh, one of them still lives in, in Utah and she like brought me out to BYU when I was thinking about going there, but didn't go. Um, <laughs> Just good. Cause I wouldn't have met her if she'd gone to yeah. BYU. It was, so, it, was, it was fake. She needed to go yeah. there, to the NYU. Yep. There you yeah. go. Yeah. yeah. Which is, I mean, it, Stars when you look at it, it seems like very unlikely, but anyway, so um, my family got sealed in the DC temple when I was about five. Um, and then we were just living like pretty good Mormon life. Um, I grew up in North Carolina, and so it was interesting to be a Mormon there because pretty regularly you would have, um, you know, our our Christian cousins would come up with all kinds of ideas about LDS people, like, yeah. uh, and and so I kind of grew up as a little apologetic before I even knew what it meant. Like I was just like, want to sit down and talk with these people and. I don't know, just like um, Interesting. back in the that day, the missionary paradigm that they were on was build on common beliefs. And so that was like very much my thing growing up. Like, let's just build on common beliefs and we'll all be friends. And sometimes it worked, sometimes it wasn't <laughs> as effective. Um, so, yeah, that is pretty much my family. And then uh, I went to boarding school, which was pretty uh, influential in um giving me the courage to kind of dream and go to New York for school, even though I'm from a pretty small town. And then, yeah, that's where I met Matt. I guess the part that I'm supposed to tell about how we got together is that I uh, told a lie of omission about my age uh, because we're about seven years apart. Um, And so the first thing he said to me was, you know, I don't date teenagers. But you must be, what, 20, 21? Um, And I said, well, I'm not 21. And he said, okay, so 20 then. (laughs) And I just didn't correct him. Um, I skipped kindergarten, so I'm like a year below, or like I'm a year younger than what you would think based on my um, grade in school. Um, And so then I let him think that for a couple of weeks. And then I was like, just kidding. I'm 19. And my birthday's in a couple of months. Um, and so by then he was stuck. Um, and then I guess like at this at this point, we could kind of go back and forth about it, just our lives. I, I think that growing up, I expected to marry a white dude because if you set your intention on marrying within the church, I mean, you look around the church and that's what you see, right? And right. So I'm just like, okay, well, this is me. Um, but I was very aware that other people did not see it that way. But yeah, it it, it kind of hurt. Like when I was a teenager, I would go to these dances, get all like dressed up, put on my makeup, and then go and like nobody would dance with me. Um, I didn't have it as bad as my brother who like sometimes when he would like a girl, a white girl, um, the families would like – turn them away but they would do all these kind of crazy things like cut off communication or one girl dad basically like paid her to come home so that they wouldn't talk anymore so it it wasn't as bad as that for me but it was just something that I always uh worried about um and so it was nice meeting Matt for a lot of reasons because he was aware um and he has kind of a I mean he has a good heart he has a lot of um attention to uh, people on the margins. And so I felt safe with him and he just kind of has a non to want air about a lot of stuff. And so I think that that was helpful in, in just building the relationship. Um, 
but yeah, I don't, I don't know what you would add to that part of things. Yeah. I, um, growing up in upstate New York, uh, in the Hudson Valley area, actually even historically it's like new Netherlands. So even back in like the 1600s, it was a very diverse, um, you know, new Amsterdam, new Netherlands is very diverse place. So my best friend was Jewish growing up. He actually still, I still consider him my best friend. Um, evangelical Christians, Jehovah witnesses, my first girlfriend was an agnostic atheist, so I kind of, kind of in that milieu of just diversity, uh, religion and ethnicity and all those things kind of just was in the background. Um, but it was more the, the, the level of inclusivity and tolerance I think was much more pronounced I think than you might encounter in a lot of um, other other localities in the country. I'm not pretending that we don't have our problems because we obviously do, but I just think um, it just growing up in that kind of, in, in that kind of culture and that kind of uh, climate was very important. I think to being open to um, dating and eventually marrying Kimberly, you know, and I, this is actually the first time I'm kind of articulating that out loud, but I think it was when I think about it. Um, and, and I did and like she already gestured toward like just the alignment of our goals, both, um, religious and, or spiritual and professional and, you know, family goals and everything just kind of seemed to be in concert. And so it was, it was nice. And, uh, you know, you find your soul's counterpoint and you kind of just, uh, you're euphoric about it. Um, uh, I will say, so, um, my, my family there were some members that were initially reluctant about the idea of marrying um, somebody of a different race and specifically black, which was interesting to me. I did not expect that. Uh, we started dating in late 2008. Uh, and um, I don't know, it was just an interesting time. It was something that, you know, Barack Obama was running for president. And so, and, and the other thing to know too, is that I'm not, hundred percent white. I'm actually a quarter Chinese. I just don't yes, look at it at all. Wow. So, so my, my mother is actually half Chinese. She's half Asian. And so this one uh, very dear family member in particular, I was struck by that. And I said, you know, like my mother is, <laughs> she's like biracial. Cause the person was making me like say, was saying like, well, what are your kids going to do? They're not going to fit in the white world. They're not going to fit in the black community, it's going to be problematic for your kids. Like think of the children, kind of <laughs> that pearl clutching argument that really aggravates me. Think of the children. And so I <laughs> joked with this person. I said, you know, because, uh, you know, it was like I said, 2008 and 2009. So I said, so I said, you know, that's a really good point. But I said, I guess when those kids come, come and they will probably come, I'll just have to tell them if you work really hard and you keep your nose clean, maybe, one day you'll be able to be president of the United States. <laughs> and the, and that, cracked, <laughs> that cracked the tension. The person <laughs> chuckled at that and said, okay, okay. And that kind of, you know, so you always got to use wow. humor to kind of break those kind of uh, barriers, I think, if you can. And uh, that was kind of a pivot point for that person. And, and now they're uh, as enthusiastic as anybody, if not more so, about our, our marriage, which is a decade strong now. And, yeah. Know, I think. Oh, go go ahead. ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say. I think on my end, uh, my parents. I forgot to include. Like, we had met in person, like, like knew each other in the flesh. But then I told my mom that I was dating Matt, and she texted back or called back and said, "Does he know that you're black?" I'm like, (laughs) "We're in the same." I forgot Lord. about that. <laughs> and I guess what she means by that or what she meant by that is like, you know, is is he prepared for like what might arise in this situation? And I think especially when you fast forward to today, which we don't have to, but you know, together we've been through a lot of just kind of strange at best, but like ignorant at worst things and um, yes. you know, my parents want what's best for us. There was one time too that my dad was like, I'm not gonna have any black grandkids, am I? Because like all of all of us married uh white people. Because uh, I mean like again, we're we're active in the church. I, church I didn't you know, know any uh like I probably can think of one person in my young adult life that was black. 
in the singles board that I met. Two, actually. One was already dating somebody. Wow. And then the other, I didn't. No, and so I, it just, it's not that I didn't oh. want to, but I, I didn't think very wasn't much about it. wasn't a choice, it was a lack of options. And yeah, there were <laughs> a lot of choices. But my mom just wanted, she was like, I just wanted to know that you're back. That's funny. So Kimberly, I'm curious if you remember ever, um, if, if you remember race explicitly ever being addressed at church. I mean, did you, as your family's getting to know the church and being introduced, were, do you remember hearing about the church's history with race? And did that affect how you saw the church or yourself or this um, future marriage? I think that we were mostly kept blissfully unaware. Like I think my parents knew I haven't ever talked to them about when they found out, but they did know at some point um, when my dad finally got baptized. So he, you know, the missionaries were in our house in and out for three years in essence before he got baptized. I think they were just like so happy that we were this family that they could tone out, you know, family five, we could like speak and this and that. Like I, I kind of remember us going on this victory tour. And so I, I suppose <laughs> part of that, okay. I, it, it, it is like lower key, but there's only, they would put us in the little programs rate. and just like <laughs> straight stuff. And so I think that that had to do with race probably, but I just didn't oh, realize it at the time. Otherwise, like, what is the big deal? Like, in my mind, again, the church was the only uh, church that I knew. So then it, it was kind of strange to us that people were kind of making a big deal. But I love my home ward. It, in terms of uh, race in the church, um, my, so I was kind of vaguely aware that people thought that Mormons were racist people, but you know, I grew up in North Carolina, um, and many people are racist. So I, I didn't really see it as like too different from like where I grew up. Like, you know, the way that my mom taught me was that, you know, encountering racist people is a possibility. And so I thought that that meant that there were like racist people. Um, but then when my grandma was taking the missionary discussion, my dad told her that blacks couldn't hold the priesthood. And I just happened to be there. So that was the first time that I had heard it. And my first uh, reaction was like, why did you mention it now? Like, <laughs> what is your problem? Like, we're on a mission here. Like, we want my grandma to join. Um, I'm careful to make this parallel because I don't want to, um, like, assume that my journey is like someone else's. But this community does it for us, so I'm just going to do it. Um, I, I, my research was on uh, LGBT people in conservative religious communities, um, and and many of them were LDS, and they talk about like once they know that they are gay, they do everything they can to deny it, and often that looks like just digging into everything church related to being like the Molly Mormon or the Peter priesthood of the ward, um, and I. I feel a kinship with that because I think that's what I did back then. So I was like the scripture mastery queen. And um, I, you know, I was like, always the person that dances. I would like play those deep cuts, like EFY tracks from the seventies. <laughs> and I had my little quote box and I was like, I was just really engaged in learning about my faith. Cause I think I was just trying to put off, some of the pain that I felt because I think I knew that I always felt out of pocket or that I didn't totally fit with what was happening and it was disconcerting before that point because it had nothing to do with like my belief how people treated us or anything but I just always sort of felt um, out of place and so when I heard it, I guess it was part comforting because I was like, okay, well, this is a significant part of why I could feel out of place. But in terms of like the details of how I wanted to think about it, I don't think I worked into my knowledge until later. And then my mom uh, wanted to read, she got this book called A Soul So Rebellious by Mary Frances Thurlogson. And it is the story of a black 
asking female convert to the church. Um, and in that, she talks about how she couldn't go through the temple. And that was one of the effects of the priesthood ban. And by that point, I, I think I was still a teenager, but I was old enough to know like that going through the temple is something that I would want to do. Um, and I was like, this. <laughs> I think that's really when I started to get like the injustice side of it. Um, like, man, it affects me too. Like, I don't, I don't know really what to do with that. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I think that I, it's been easier to take than you would think because of just accepting that there are racist and prejudiced people in the world. Um, and it is still, uh, hurtful. It was still hurtful to learn these yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would you guys maybe talk just a bit about um, what the last few weeks have been like for you? Obviously, um, since in particular the murder of George Floyd, I mean, there's been, uh, I, I think, a more, uh, a lot more consciousness around uh, issues of, of race than perhaps there's been in, you know, decades in our, in our country. Um, you guys are, you know, somewhat uniquely positioned to you know to have people look to you um you know for for advice and guidance and uh just wanting to listen in a you know in a time like this and i'm so i'm curious what um what these what these weeks have been like for you and what you know uh what it's been like maybe internally and what you're what you're seeing externally all right since you've been speaking all right um <laughs> so so interestingly enough like when i saw the, I, I actually did like intentionally watch the video. I always try to watch um, or get as much information as possible about whenever whenever these things occur. Uh, it was, I mean, I, it was definitely striking in the fact that it was so much more. Um, it hit you in a different way viscerally because of the slow nature versus the what normally happens at with the with a firearm. It's just so quick. But this was kind of an intentional, slow murdering of somebody in broad daylight with several bystanders saying, this person is dying, basically, you can't breathe and nothing's, nothing's being done. Uh, it, it made me think about, so um, I don't know if Kimberly mentioned this, but when we went to, so we were in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I, I got a second master's at, at Harvard for my school administration uh, degrees. Uh, so that's what I do now professionally. And uh, my, my advisor, he actually started a course that year, uh, that year I was there that I participated in. And it led to uh, uh, a nonprofit that's there now that's Harvard affiliated that's called RIDES. And it stands for Reimagining Integration, uh, Div Diverse and Equitable Schools. And we kind of did a the inspiration for that was just this uh, cadence, this disgusting cadence of black lives being taken, um, typically in involving law enforcement. Uh, it just every every few months, it seemed like something would hit the news where it was just this gross injustice. And so that was back in 2015. And, uh, and I was familiar with it before then, but that was a real launch pad for me where I became much more like steeped in the history of it, uh, where it comes from, reading a lot of literature about it, and also, you know, stuff that's very recent in terms of research. And so when I, when I saw it, I said, wow, this is very um, striking, but I did not, to be fair, I did not expect it to be this groundswell. Like I didn't expect it to be this bellwether of change that it has seemed to be for the, for the culture of, of the country, which has been refreshing. Uh, and I hope it continues. Uh, but, uh, it was for, for that, for those reasons, I was, I was like very, um, it, it didn't surprise me when I saw the video, but the, the aftermath has been surprising in, in a good way, in a positive way. Um, I think for me, as I think about it, um, I'm grateful that for the most part, um, we can have a relationship that is like pretty copacetic. And, and I don't think too much about the fact that I'm black and he's white, not because I don't think about me being black. I think about that every day, but in terms of it, um, I'm not having as many of these like out of pocket moments 
uh, between us. And, and that's been great with the exception of like when there are uniquely black things and it could be anything good or bad. I just want to like cope with it by myself. So, um, you know, Matt wanted to see the James Baldwin documentary that came out a couple years ago, and I like didn't see it with him. I saw it with the few black friends that I had. Who didn't see Utah. Black Panther with me? <laughs> black Panther. I think that he saw it two or three times. What did you see it two or three times I saw in it theaters? Twice, yeah. twice in theaters. theaters. Yeah. I saw it in theaters by myself like two weeks before it came out on DVD. Yeah. So like this is how I like to deal with black stuff sometimes it just like becomes too much for me and I think that that would normally be where I like a fellowship with other black people but sometimes in Utah you don't have that uh option and so then I just like want to spend time by myself um as a psychologist, I have been very fortunate to continue working through the pandemic. In fact, uh, my work has gone up, um, which is, you know, great. Um, I, I think in this case, um, it's been hard because I feel the temptation to just like keep moving, keep moving. And, and that's how I cope with it on my own um, instead of reaching out for help when I feel like I'm struggling. Um, but these things hit me really hard. Like my daughter was born, not this one, but the older one. Um, you know, I like to say that July 11th and July 12th were really great days. But then on July 13th, George Zimmerman, Trayvon Martin's killer got acquitted. And then it just totally shifted how I felt about what it would be like to raise black children or like, what would they look like? Uh, would they even want to be black if they didn't look black? So all of these things. Um, and, and then being a parent changes how comfortable I feel with like going out to protest or doing things that um, would put any of us in danger. And so then a lot of times I am left alone with how I feel about stuff. And so that's hard. Um, so I've been busy the last couple of weeks. It's been crazy. Like it, normally when these things happen, it's like to scroll Facebook and see like who is reacting and who isn't. And, and so many times in the past, uh, you know, this has been nine, 10 years, um, you know, the amount of people who can go on with their lives and not react to this stuff it is many, especially when most of the people I'm friends with at this point are members of the church. I like to say that I'm not reading anything into it, but I am. And so I start to feel this like conspicuous and invisible feeling again. Um, this time is different though, because you know, everybody's out of work or whatever, working from home. We got lots of time for social media. And so we don't have as much time to scroll past these things. And so I too feel hopeful for this time um, of awakening that, that maybe we'll start to move the needle. I feel like it's taking longer for people to come in with the arguments like on the counter side, like, oh, but what was he doing? And all these things don't exist and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And so I I feel hopeful. It has not taken away the the pain, um, but I, I feel a lot of of hope for what's happening. Some Mormons are going to mourn though. Like they're just going to keep on keeping on. And, and I don't really know uh, how else to, to say that. Uh, bless their kind hearts. Um, some of this stuff I think will take a while for people to really feel convicted. I think a lot of people talk about um, racism as something that hateful people do and not as something that like, anyone could feel the effects of or anybody could um, use as a means to gain over their brother or sister. And, and that's the stuff that I spend uh, my life working on is, is how to, to get people to see and reach out for their brother in a more meaningful way. Um, so the gaps there are, are sometimes challenging and disappointing, but I still feel hope about what's to come. Yeah. I love that. I, yeah, I, I think that's something we've been learning is that racism doesn't have to be 
you know, it doesn't have to be an action that you take or something you feel inside necessarily. It's more like it's the air that surrounds us, you know, it's this totally. entire structure and system that we're all kind of swimming in. And I was it just for a clarification purpose, um, Kimberly, you're saying that when you scroll through Facebook, it is helpful or you feel a sense of concern or solidarity from your white friends when you do see posts from them, you know, about about issues of race. Yes. Um, and I feel like that's key. Even when people say, I don't know what to say, but I see you. Um, I feel seen by that. But like when people are posted pictures of like, oh, some fun thing they did today. It's not, it's not that I'm like <laughs> spending all of my time. Yeah, it means. <laughs> Look at this quiche I baked this morning yeah. for breakfast. Yeah. It was delicious. I mean, like, to be fair, my content <laughs> is like much of the same. Like, you know, plenty of Penny and Eva pics on my social media um and i just i i am looking for connection at this point i'm a long way from home um physically and emotionally and sometimes i just need to see that someone is behind me i think if i weren't um matt or matt's wife i suppose and i had uh read I, I'm not saying this well. So, like, Matt wrote this thing, right? He wrote this email to our ward, and it was like, repent ye <laughs> of racism. No, it wasn't like that. He he wants to say that it was uh, more uh, more thoughtful than that, and it was. Um, and I know that there are a lot of people who didn't get that from their wards and their communities, and it hurts. It feels like the people that you turn to, especially being faithful people, um, I think black people are pretty faithful people, um, not just as a, you know, colloquialism or stereotype, but I think like the research bears this out. Uh, right now in the country, there's more black religious people than like any other uh, religious group besides sure. us, maybe. Um <laughs> Or, or no, they might they might be us then. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, so we're spiritual people, and when things happen, we want to turn to our faith community. So then, when they're not there to hold us, you know, it, it's sad. Um, and so, I I think that there's been a lot of people respond to the words that Matt said, which he put on social media, um, because it gives hope that people can see us. We're all taught that Jesus left the 90 and 9 and went to the 1, but it's not every day that we see that in action from the membership. Um, yeah. And so those things are, are meaningful when they do occur. I love that. I This is so interesting too, because I think a lot of our listeners uh, live in places geographically, or maybe it's just their ward, but that are predominantly white. And so I think that there is a lot of discomfort around knowing what to do because they aren't, they are, they don't have black friends. Like they just, they don't have black neighbors. And so I think for a lot of people, they just don't know what to do. They don't want to, they don't want to speak when they shouldn't speak and they don't want to say the wrong thing. And so they're trying to be really careful. And, and so that's so good to hear that like, just, you know, showing up and saying something, even if it's, I don't know what to say, but I, I see what's going on and I'm working on my own stuff to, to be helpful here. I, I think that's, that's so useful to know because I think so much of the silence that we're seeing is, is just this, they're trying not to do something wrong. You know, just like, yeah. it feels like that's, that feels safer, you know? So I, I would love to hear if there's anything else you feel like your friends and neighbors, especially in, in your ward or somewhere where, where you were really a minority um, what can they do to make this um, conversation feel safer and um, make you feel like you're being held on Sunday or just, you know, in your, in your community? Um, I mean, I think about uh, one of the things that Matt mentioned that he didn't get like scolded about but just like had some of the uh curiosity from 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 other people was this idea of a privilege yeah so maybe i should should we elucidate a little bit what was in the message to do 
Okay, good. fine. Yeah. Zero listed at the yeah, message. So, so in the message, I, I, I took this, this vignette that happened to us in real life where we came back from a road trip um, from North Carolina and our apartment was locked in New York City, a 50 floor walk up. And we were sitting down on the floor and we we're tr trying to figure out, like, what do we do? It, Eva was one year old at the time. It was one in the morning and the keys were in North Carolina. And we're like, well, there's a 50 50 chance that the window to our bedroom is unlocked because we often have where it was. So it's like, so I could try to scale up the fire escape and get into the apartment. And so we sat down and did the kind of calculus, <laughs> tortured calculus in our head. Like, what's the chances that I get, you know, uh, like the worst could happen, like where I get injured, seriously injured or even killed trying to do this thing. And we finally determined like, I'm, I'm a pasty white guy. Like it, even at one in the morning and we're in Washington Heights, which is a predominantly Dominican, which is an Afro-Caribbean neighborhood. They look like me. So yeah. They look like Kimberly. Uh, so we were like, all right, so let's roll the dice. Let's go up because if we don't do this, we're going to be here for at least another hour or two. We're going to have to pay a hundred bucks to get into our own apartment. It's just really aggravating. And we're living in New York City on teacher's salary. So, you know, we scale up, sure enough, the window's open. I'm able to get in and unlock the door and get to let it let her in. And I just we thought that that little vignette was just encapsulated white privilege so perfectly. Like I could do something that I would not have felt comfortable doing if I was a uh, a man of color, specifically a black man, because I just thought the the likelihood of somebody seeing me, the police you know, thinking I was doing something untoward and shooting first and asking questions later would just have been too high. Even even though it's still remote, still just too high. It would have doubled or tripled or, you know, whatever, in order of magnitude higher that that would have happened. And I wouldn't have taken the chance. We would have paid the 100 bucks and waited two hours. And so I started off with that in the message. And then I continued. I said, like, juxtaposing my wife's experience being a black woman and my experience being a white man, I said, we, we're living in almost two parallel realities. I have white privilege and she experiences racism. Not the racism of cross burnings of generations past, but just the racism of not being able to break into your own home because you might get arrested or shot. If I were a black man, I would not feel comfortable jogging in the morning. I'd, I'd wait till broad daylight. I would just not, you know, in my own neighborhood and, and stuff like that. And I said, white privilege, uh, racism, the white privilege part, I think a lot of people when they saw that, it just was very inflammatory. Um, overwhelmingly positive responses from my ward and from uh, people outside the ward too. But the people that did push back on that, that's the, that term was, was something that got them, got a rise out of them. Cause it just, it felt, I guess, like I was being, trying to be provocative. Uh, it was never used by the brethren in any of conference talks. They've talked about racism and, you know, and messages from the church and condemning that, but they haven't talked about privilege. But it was something I felt comfortable with. And I also said um, you know, to, to the denouement of the, the message was uh, asking, you know, Lord, is it I? I said, like, that was a haunting mm -hmm. millennial question. Lord, is it I? Am I doing something that could be considered racist? And I said, you know, I don't have any excuses uh, and I'm not magically inoculated just because I've been married to a black woman and have black children, and have black in-laws and all this stuff. Like it doesn't make me magically unable to do something racist, uh, thinking, believing, saying or doing. And I said, just just the same way that being in close proximity and having intimacy with women prevents me from doing something sexist. And I said, like, look, like, listen, this is the hundredth anniversary of women's suffrage. Like a hundred years ago, there were millions of men that loved their wives and would have laid down their, laid, laid their own lives down to save these women from, from injury or death. And yet these same men thought that they were incapable. These women were incapable of voting responsibly and they vehemently and fiercely tried to stop women's suffrage. And I said like, so that's kind of what's the close of, of the message basically. It's like, you cannot, you cannot think you're magically inoculated just because you have a black friend or even a black relative. Like you're not, that's not something you could say. Usually there's, there's a handful of people you can think of that are the most, would be the most marginalized in your average Mormon world. Like they're, they're not white. English is not their first language. Maybe they have a disabled, you know, a kid that with a disability or something like that. And you say, and, and, and they're, and maybe they're, they're, uh, they're struggling economically as well. And you think, all right, so what is it that we could do that would be really welcoming for that, for that, that family or that individual and, and use that person or that household as a, as a, as a, as a springboard for really thoughtful planning at the ward level. And if you do that, 
consistently, you'll have a better ward. You'll be a better ward. It'll be a more Christian, more Christ-like, more Zion-like ward. And I try to have that be an undercurrent to all of the planning and all the execution that we that we do at the ward level. I, I think I do okay job. Like I said, Kimberly, Kimberly does help, uh, sometimes hold my feet to the fire. Like, you didn't think about this or that. And I appreciate that. I try to be as, also open to feedback. Leadership that's not willing to listen to, to critical feedback is, is, is bankrupt leadership. It's not going to be yeah. any, it's never going to get any better. And, and, yeah. Yeah. Sphere of influence in general, you know, even if you're not in a leadership position in your word, how can you, how can you use that idea in your own small sphere of influence, wherever you have some, wherever yeah. you have some power. And it can be, it can be overwhelming when you see so much injustice in the world and wanting to like solve everything or else you feel like you can't do anything. But those, just those little things you can do with your, with your neighbors and your own wards and your own community, that's where, that's where it can really, can, can really happen. Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to be, it's going to be prior thought and you should crowdsource it too. Don't think you have to lock yourself in a room. I mean, there's a reason why we have councils and counselors and all the different organizations in the church. Like, I feel like you just have to be very thoughtful if you are in a leadership position, but like you said, yeah, in a healthy, in a healthy organizational culture, people will be able to say anything and people be open to it, but that doesn't always exist. Unfortunately. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. That, that, that's, that's a great little like to do, you know, like something we can do tomorrow, like something we can start working on right away. I love that idea. Yeah. Thank you both right. so much. Kimberly, anything else you wanted to add? Um, I think one thing that has helped me to uh, keep my faith in trying times um, is uh, so to rewind. Um, but one of the big things that takes up my time here in, in Utah is being in the Deborah Bonner Unity Gospel Choir. And I give Ooh. them a shout out whenever I can, because for one, it takes up so much of my time. Um, and two, I love Deborah. Uh, Deborah has been a great uh, mentor and spiritual leader. And she often talks about how Jesus is her best friend and she walks with him daily and he tells her what to do. If the spirit says something, if, if Jesus says something, she she does it. Um, and she kind of leaves the refining process to later. <laughs> um, and she's she's open to uh, feedback, but she's she's not going to let much stop her from what the spirit says she should do. And you know, Matt is making a face because it it has led her to some late nights and, and lots of work on, on projects that she has, but it's fine because I, I like watching her watch God in essence. And I, I feel like the times that I've been most values consistent in my life is when I have acted on these impulses that come from my relationship with the divine. And sometimes it's hard to do that uh, especially when everybody else is not doing the same things, um, is not feeling the same things. Um, it's really hard to maintain a narrative that's your own um, when there's a lot of pressure to, to fit in and conform. Um, but the relationship that God has with each of us is individual, and we know this um, intellectually. And so... In, in theory, that should lead to all kinds of exchange like Matt was talking about uh, because the Lord is going to impress us in all kinds of ways. Um, and so I, I think it's helpful uh, to think about that as, as people are trying to figure out how uh, to make a difference. Um, you know, the Lord knows the desires of our heart and he can speak to that. And then we can do that. <laughs> um the I was at a gospel music like workshop thing with a, a black artist, uh, not LDS, but he does gospel music. And he said, you know, we often think that uh, we often say that God's ways are our ways. But then when we're moved to do something that is like totally unlike what we would do, we're very quick to say, well, that's not God. Yeah. But then you just said, you know, um, that his ways aren't our ways. And so I think that it, I, I hope that we can all have the fear to, to go where he would have us go boldly. Um, yeah. Love that. Thanks.
Yeah. Okay. Thank you guys so much. It really has been an honor and a pleasure to speak with you. And it's so important to get your perspectives. So can't yeah. thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you. That was thank so you. great. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Thank you so much to Kimberly and Matt for coming on. We're so inspired by their examples and their faith, and we hope that you are too. Thanks so much for listening. And as always, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.